all are aware of the power of thoughts. Thoughts have the ability of increasing our blood pressure or lowering it. They can make our hearts beat faster or slower. They can keep us awake all night or put us to sleep. They can make us happy or sad. As the Buddha said 2500 years ago, I have been cheated, I have been harmed, I have been robbed, I have been deceived. Misery never ceases for those who continue to harbor such thoughts. I have been cheated, I have been robbed, I have been harmed, I have been deceived. Misery completely ceases for those who stop harboring such thoughts. So thoughts are the basis of feelings, sentiments, emotions. Thoughts can lead us to success or make us failures. Those who learned how to choose their thoughts properly became successful in their lives. If we can also learn this art, it can lead us to prosperity, happiness, fulfillment, and well-being. The mind is the factory that generates thoughts. It is also the garden that harbors these thoughts. The Bhagavad Gita says, Uplift yourself by the power of your mind. Do not degrade yourself. For the mind has the capacity to become your best friend. And it can also be your worst enemy. The thoughts that are generated by the mind lead to images. Images lead to emotions. Emotions create further thoughts. Those thoughts lead to further images and further emotions. This entire chain can lift us upwards or it can make our mind into a toxic waste. Now, in your house, if I happen to come with a garbage can, and I empty the can in your drawing room, what would be your reaction? You would either insist that I clear it off, or you would call the police. You would not permit your house to have any garbage there. And we are allowing our mind to be full of toxic thoughts. These have repercussions. That is why sometime or the other in our journey of life, we realize that for success, prosperity, fulfillment, we will need to learn the art of how to manage the mind. When we seriously apply ourselves to it, we realize that the mind has two aspects. One is the conscious mind. The conscious mind we are aware of, the sentiments, the feelings, the logic, the rationality that we are adopting. So there is another aspect of the mind, which is the subconscious aspect, that you are not aware of, but it is working like the ocean has the waves on top and then the depth below, which is so much more in extent. So many of the sentiments, attitudes, 
phobias, inclinations arise from the subconscious. Consider this example. A child, before learning how to swim, fell into the pool and the experience was extremely frightening. Now, the conscious mind did experience those sentiments, but slowly, slowly they were forgotten about. And the subconscious, like a hard drive, retained it in the memory. The consequence was that child developed a fear of water. Even after 20 years, that fear remains. The, the person now as an adult doesn't know why I am so fearful of water. But every time the water comes, the subconscious says, I am in danger. And that is why the heart starts beating faster, the sweat breaks out. So the subconscious continues to retain like the, the cloud. It has images from our entire life. It has got the amount of data of hundreds of thousands of Encyclopedia Britannicals. The conscious has forgotten about it, but your personality, your experiences are being impacted by it. Consider another example. Somebody as a child got locked in the elevator for four hours and experienced fear at that moment. Now, subsequently, the conscious mind released that experience. It's forgotten about. And yet, it is embedded in the subconscious. And that is why the person is experiencing claustrophobia. Somebody told me, Swamiji, I have so much of claustrophobia when they needed to take my MRI. You know, one has to go through that scanner. Every time they would pull my body in, I would break into a sweat and finally they were not able to do it in my conscious state. So, again, one may not realize where is this phobia coming from, but it is coming from the subconscious. So, the subconscious has the ability to control our bodily processes for our benefit or for our harm. Consider, for example, you are standing on the roadside when a speeding car is coming. Now your conscious registers, there is a car and I am in danger. Your conscious mind does an analysis. Do I need to jump forward? Do I need to jump back? And the conscious mind makes a conscious decision that I need to get out of here quick. It immediately, the subconscious comes into action. All the muscles and bodily processes are brought into play and in the split fraction of a second, you have jumped back. The subconscious, some scientists have analyzed works at 40,000 times the speed of the conscious. So, the conscious mind is providing the inputs to the subconscious. The conscious mind is responsible for reason, for logic, for the thoughts, and the subconscious is responsible for instincts, inspiration, attitudes, fears, phobias, your bodily processes. Those who realize this understand that the subconscious could make us sick and the subconscious could also heal us. If somebody repeatedly thought with the conscious mind that mushrooms are harmful to me, and mushrooms have a bad impact upon me. The subconscious doesn't logic it out. The subconscious receives the orders that the boss says mushrooms are harmful 
And next time when you are eating mushrooms, the subconscious says, you know, mushrooms are here, I need to fall sick now. And the person has a reaction. He doesn't understand where it's coming from. That is why in medical science we have the concept of white collar hypertension. What is white collar hypertension? Somebody's BP is perfect, 120 by 80. He or she goes for the annual medical checkup. The doctor tests and says, you got a borderline BP of 130. Well, really, that's never happened like this before. Doctor says, don't you worry, this is called white collar hypertension. When you came to the hospital, your subconscious seeing all the hospital staff in their white collars decided that I'm going to the hospital, I must be sick. <laughs> and it created the symptoms of sickness in the body. And the reverse is also true. This is what leads to the placebo effect. What is the placebo effect? The doctor. The patient comes to the doctor. And the doctor realizes that he has already got enough medication. If I give more, there will be a side reaction. What to do? The doctor writes a placebo. The patient thinking that this is the medicine, takes it. And medical science informs us that a large extent of cure happens merely by a blank pill. Once I was giving a lecture series in Tampa, Florida, spiritual lecture series, my host was a doctor. When the morning he was making a presentation on a new drug to pharmacists. And that was when I was seeing, he said, look, this is the graph. This is how the medicine has impacted in studies. And this is the graph of the placebo. So every time he would present a graph, he would compare it with the placebo. And I would see that if the medicine is working 65% of the times, the placebo is working 40% of the times. Once again, the subconscious is coming into play. Consider these two, the conscious and the subconscious. Through this analogy, there is a ship. The captain on the ship knows what is going on. There are the crew working below in the engine room. He shouts out orders to them. They f listen to the orders and follow. They are not able to see what is going on. It is now the captain's job to pass on the proper orders. The crew are faithful and loyal servants. They will do what is asked for them, but they will not analyze. They will not use logic. Similarly, is the conscious mind that is passing on orders. And then we have the subconscious that is like a faithful servant. That is receiving all the images, all the thoughts and then acting upon them. So if we wish to reprogram our subconscious mind, we have to start by sending proper messages with the conscious mind. This brings us to the first tool for reprogramming, which is self-talk.